So I was going to say a little bit about the idea of treating aging or anti-aging treatments. Uh, and this is a complex topic. Uh, let me say, first of all, I, I think I should say this, which is that I'm all for that. I think, I think we want that. And the reason why is because aging is fundamentally a horrible thing. Um, in many ways, I think, you know, it's part of the human condition, which is almost maddening um, and somewhat similar. I say it to the students sometimes to a situation where somebody comes to you and they tell you that, OK, in 20 years, some men are going to come and knock on your door in the middle of the night. They're going to take you away and they're going to torture you for about two years until you die. Um, and, that, you know, that's pretty much our condition as human beings. And that's um, what happened to both my parents. I, I watched that happen to them as they were killed by diseases of aging. So aging is a horrendous thing. Um, so in terms of um, the idea of treating aging, there are problems, I think, with thinking about what a treatment, what do you mean by treating aging? What, what, what is an, a, a, a treatment for aging? So I've argued um, that uh, you can't really make a distinction between aging and aging-related disease, although sometimes people have done, people do. Um, so a treatment for aging is a treatment for aging-related disease as well. Um, so does that mean that having a coronary bypass operation or having a hip replacement operation, that that's a treatment for aging? Is that an anti-aging treatment? That's not usually what people mean. I've also argued that there probably isn't a central mechanism of aging, although some of the work on the short-lived animal models like C. elegans uh, gave the impression that that was the case. I think this was illusory, actually. Um, so if, there's, if there isn't a central mechanism of aging that you treat, and if there's a, not a difference between aging-related diseases and aging itself, what is an anti-aging treatment? What does it really mean? Um, what I would propose as a sort of solution to this, this problem is, is actually a new definition of anti-aging treatment, which is to say that really when you talk about anti-aging treatment, you're talking about treatments that are preventative. Um, and that's partly to distinguish them from simply everything to do with any aging related disease. It also kind of uses the anti, anti-aging, you're essentially preventing them from happening in the first place. And it also acknowledges the fact that in the laboratory, what we can, we, this is what we can do. This is, this is what we've learned. One of the things we've learned in the laboratory is that you can intervene and prevent or de least, at least decelerate the appearance of aging related diseases. This is very strong across the animal models. Um, but by that definition, that would mean that, um, for example, um, things that affect even just even prevent one aspect of aging would be anti-aging treatments. So, for example, uh, sunscreen, uh, sunscreen to prevent uh, UV radiation damage of skin. Uh, so that's part of aging. Uh, and you can use sunblock and sunblock will prevent it will it will delay and protect against that aspect of aging. So that's an anti-aging treatment. Uh, or even if you go to the hygienist and you have, this, you have the plaque taken away from your top of your teeth and that prevents aging of your teeth, that's, an, a, that's a preventative treatment of, of an aspect of aging. So that's an anti-aging treatment. Um, in terms of this, the older notion of anti-aging treatment is something against the whole of aging. Uh, this is really an in interesting topic. So in C. elegans, um, you can manipulate individual genes in C. elegans and see extraordinary increases in lifespan. You can double and triple and quadruple their lifespan. Even one group increased them up to tenfold. Um, and an implication of that, this is what drew me into this field, was that there's some sort of extraordinary core processes of aging which underlie the whole of aging. And if you could understand that, you could do extraordinary things with human beings. You could have people living you know, you could slow aging right down and just stave off diseases of aging for many, many decades, you know, w wonderful. Um, but uh, I think that, uh, that notion was also consistent with uh, some of the, uh, the, the theories of aging that were predominant in the 90s, particularly, like the oxidative damage theory. Uh, so there was a notion, um, people expressed the idea that if you could enhance uh, maintenance processes within within organisms, uh, you could essentially 
control completely the accumulation of damage and you could extend lifespan dramatically. So this is what people kind of thought they were doing. Uh, but I think more recently, um, it looks, it's become clear that the, the higher up the, uh, uh, the sort of the um, ladder, evolutionary ladder, you go uh, uh, from worms up to flies to mice to rhesus monkeys to humans, uh, the, more, the less plasticity there seems to be with um, uh, this, the, the less of a sort of innate plasticity there seems to be in aging. So uh, one of the things which I think has been a big shock over the last years uh, was the results of tests of an intervention called dietary restriction on rhesus monkeys. So this is an intervention which in, in rodents and many other short-lived animals slows aging down dramatically. So in, in mice and rats you get 50% increase in lifespan suppression of a whole range of aging related diseases. Uh, and this was tested on rhesus monkeys and the results were really quite disappointing. Um, at most the effects that, that were seen, the small effects, look as if they were rather likely to be rescue of, of harmful effects of overeating, which is not what you see in the rodents. It's something quite different. Um, so I think that at the moment it doesn't seem likely that there's any sort of magical plasticity that you can tap into in the way that you can in, for example, in C. elegans. Um, however, uh, things change very rapidly within the aging field and that's one of the features of this field which is rather marvellous if you're working it. It's so unstable. Theories rise and fall very, very quickly. And something that's happened very recently which is just incredible is the development of uh, recent findings in rodents uh, looking at a particular type of cell called a senescent cell. This is a very particular type of, of cell that accumulates uh, with age. Uh, and has been shown to contribute to the generation of a whole range of different aging related diseases from multiple forms of cancer to cataracts to uh, cardiovascular disease many other kinds of pathology and experimentally in the mouse if you clear these cells which you can do through complex genetic interventions and you can now do it with uh, a class of drugs that are called senolytic drugs uh, you get these remarkable effects on health. You get a, essentially a broad spectrum protection against diseases of aging. Uh, but the mice still get the diseases, they just get them later. So it isn't, it isn't affecting the entire aging process. But what it is doing, it, it, it seems to be affecting, uh, as it were, a cause of senescent multimorbidity. So it's an underlying cause of multiple diseases of aging. So this is something radical and exciting and, and quite different to the way that um, uh, conventional medicine is generally looking at diseases of aging, which is to wait until people get the diseases and to study them individually in separate disciplinary silos, you know, in oncology or cardiology or, 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 and so on. Uh, so these, this, this just looks wonderful, but it's in mice. So uh, I think the prospects for this working in humans I, th I th personally, I think it looks quite good, but you know we've been here before many times. So, so you know, I think um, I'm not particularly optimistic about uh, interventions that are going to have major effects in terms of you know adding many years to life or anything based on the technologies that are around at the moment. Um, but I think the, the the possibilities, for example, for senotherapy, these drugs that clear senescent cells, as an example of something that's come out of the uh, experimental biology of aging is very, very promising at the moment. I mean, I don't want to give the impression that I'm being uh, pessimistic mm -hmm. about the aging field. Um, I mean, I think that in a way I've, I feel both pessimistic and optimistic at the moment uh, because there were a number of elements of the field that looked extremely promising, like the plas this huge plasticity in aging that you see in the short-lived animal models, uh, the oxidative damage theory and the whole damage theory of aging, which as an intervention that was going to have dramatic effects, dietary restriction, which looks quite disappointing. Um, but, and I think um, the thing which doesn't seem to be there is this natural plasticity in aging that you see in short-lived animals, in humans. 
uh, at least in terms of the possibility of slowing aging down. Um, and one of the uh, recent results that I think is consistent with that is that um, the, uh, the maximum lifespan for human beings worldwide for many, many years, for many decades, was increasing year on year. Um, but it's actually, uh, um, it's actually uh, hit a ceiling, it's plateaued. And it did that around about um, the year 2000. Um, and it's even becoming clear that some of the very long-lived people, the, the real record holders worldwide, uh, uh, that a number of them may be essentially unreliable evidence. So, uh, for example, uh, it, it's recently been, um, uh, a, a case has been made that a woman who was thought to be the oldest woman in the world, Jean Calmont, was actually not actually Jean Calmont. It was actually her daughter who she switched identities with uh, when her mother died. Um, so, um, on the other hand, I think if we kind of turn things upside down, uh, one can make the case that, um, that there is a plasticity in human aging, but it actually runs the other way, which is that you can accelerate aging in human beings. Um, and that's something that very much seems to happen when people eat too much. So when people become very overweight, uh, it would appear that the aging process is speeded up. So one possibility is that interventions that actually uh, protect against aging in the short-lived animal models actually could be used as ways to prevent accelerated aging in people who are, who are overweight. But in terms of the, uh, optimism, the thing that really makes me optimistic is the possibility of really understanding aging. This is, this is quite aside from what you can do with the knowledge because that must be possible. And I think over the last years that the basic concepts of aging have changed so much and they've, they've sort of evolved and transformed so much um, that we must be coming close to the point where we have the basic foundation of an understanding of aging. And that is, has to be the way forward to, to be able to, uh, to see what can be done in terms of um, preventing late life disease and, and allowing people to live uh, longer, healthier lives in the future.